This time we are in Luke chapter 12, and I'm just going to rip the band-aid off, folks. This is that sermon about money. I know, you're welcome. Uh, and you know, I've been preaching here for uh, getting close to nine years now, and let me assure you, I've never done a series about money, and here's our current series title. Ready for it? Luke. <laughs> That's our series title. One of my friends is making fun of me that the banner outside has been out there for so long it's starting to get crispy and, you know, burnt by the sun. We'll just leave it out there. By the time we're done with the book, it's going to be a, it's going to be a relic. It's just going to be shreds. Uh, but we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. And today we're in Luke chapter 12, and we're going to address what it addresses. Uh, because when the Bible gets to it, we get to it. And so with that fair warning, and I'm sorry if you're visiting today, Uh, So, you know, if you want to get up, pretend like you're going to get a refill on coffee and just go to your car and leave. I won't hold it against you, but that's where we're going in the text. As we start, let me tell you something. Preaching can be weird sometimes, but how often are you in a place where you are looking at a sea of faces? They're all looking at you, right? You can only look at one person at a time, but as you look out, it's a unique perspective. You know, I scan the congregation. Sometimes I I see, see these faces looking back at me, and sometimes I know... This person's not listening right now. They're physically present, and mentally, they're not here. They're not thinking about this sermon right now. And and mind you, I have to keep going, right? I just got to keep going, because there are people that are listening. But come on, be honest with me. We all know what it's like to have your mind wander, especially during a sermon. It happens. You know, for maybe for the first 10 minutes, you're tracking, and then all of a sudden, you kind of take a mental field trip. And there's various reasons for this. Maybe it's that single guy who's kind of looking across the room. He notices a beautiful young gal. He's thinking, who is that lovely lady? Maybe it's the single gal distracted by looking at a guy across the room. He's like, who's that weirdo looking at me? (laughs) There's all sorts of stuff that could distract us. Those random intrusive thoughts. Did I turn the stove off this morning? Why does the word ambiguous have just one meaning. Who put an S in the word lisp? That was kind of mean, wasn't it? Anyways, here's why I say all this. Back in our passage of Luke 12, we find Jesus who's been preaching a sermon to an enormous crowd of thousands, but we find out that there's one guy who has not been listening. He's not tracking. He's he's obsessed with something else. He's in the audience but he's totally distracted over something different than what Jesus has been talking about. He's distracted by something happening in his life, in his family. And uh, let me just kind of quickly review where we are in our study. Luke 12, at this point, Jesus has now set his face towards Jerusalem. He's bound and determined to die on the cross for our sins. And nothing's going to sway or deter him from that goal. And he's doing it out of love for us. And this is because we human beings are born with the same problem that needs fixing. We're born with with sin. Sinners by nature and by choice. And the Bible teaches us that this sin separates us from a holy God. And the only way we can be reconciled with God is if someone qualified pays the penalty for our sin. And that someone is Jesus Christ because he's the perfect, sinless son of the living God. And so in Luke's gospel, we read about how Jesus willingly lays down his life as the perfect sacrifice for sinful humanity. He's generous, he's selfless, and now in chapter 12, he's, he's making his way to do that, to lay down his life for sinners, and he's been preaching, teaching all along the way, and as we pick the text back up, uh, in the immediate context here, Jesus has been preaching a, a pretty seeker, insensitive sermon, I would say, a lot of hard topics. That, in fact, it's been, been pretty heavy. The, the first 12 verses, if you notice, of, of Luke 12, we, we covered them last week, Quite heavy, I would say. It's all about God's judgment. Jesus is teaching us about hell. He's encouraging his followers to boldly stand up for him, even if they experience pain and rejection in a fallen world. He's trying to prepare his disciples for that time when they will be persecuted for their faith. Last week, we even saw how Jesus was teaching about one particular sin that God will never forgive, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus has been preaching a sermon with hard topics, many churches won't even touch these days. 
and they're hard, sobering words, but we've been learning that, that God gives us these hard words to produce soft hearts in us. And that's what makes uh, what happens next so weird. You know, it's just hard-hitting truths after truth after truth. And smack dab in the middle of that, the unexpected happens. We get to verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Just picture this. This random guy's like, enough about you. What about my money? <laughs> Jesus is in the middle of preaching, and he's like, hey, let's talk about my bank account. And you know what? That's actually not so unusual because rabbis, as Jesus was, were often asked to make decisions on points of law. And this man wants Jesus to help him with something. Uh, but the timing is a little strange. We must admit that. Now let's look, at, look again at what he says. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now here's what's strange. Is that he's commanding Jesus to do this, right? It's a bad idea to command Jesus to do anything. And here this guy is barking orders at the Son of God, which is not a good look. He's, hey God, do what I say. And so this conversation seems to have gotten off on the wrong foot. But notice something. Jesus will take what otherwise might have been an irritating intrusion, and he's going to turn it into a valuable lesson for those of us with ears to hear. So we have this random guy. We don't know anything else about him. But he wants Jesus to command his brother to divide the inheritance with him. And the way he says it, I can't help but picture his brothers in that crowd there as well. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm thinking if that's true, this is quite embarrassing. You kind of feel bad for his brother. Now culturally, it helps us to understand that in the ancient Jewish world, once a father died, the inheritance was given. And we read in Deuteronomy chapter 21 about something called the right of the firstborn. What happened was this. If a man had two sons... The older son would receive two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son would receive one-third. And so the man speaking here apparently is the younger brother, and he's telling Jesus to command his older brother to divide it down the middle. Tell my brother to go halvesies with me, Jesus. And he seems convinced that, that it's his brother who's the problem here, the greedy, the stingy one, and not he himself. And so he's telling Jesus, Lord... Fix my brother. He's the one with the sin problem. And I think we can learn something even just from this. That we are all tempted to focus on the issues of other people and ignore our own issues. And he's so focused on his, his brother rather than himself. And you know, this is our default setting as sinners. We focus on other people's shortcomings and sin rather than our own. Why is that? Why do you think? Well, because it's much easier to confess the sins of other people than our own. Wouldn't it be so easy if the Bible commanded us to confess the sins of others? But it doesn't. You know, we'd be so faithful to that, I think. But it doesn't say others. It says to confess our own sins. Now, here's a verse to remember. 1 John 1, starting in verse 9, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so this is part of the Christian life. Repentance is a daily activity for us believers. We confess our sins to the Father and receive his forgiveness. And he's, he's faithful and just to forgive. Now normally, we tend to judge other people based on their behavior, and we judge ourselves based on our good intentions. And so the scales are a little askew there. You know, I'm, I'm more prone to be more critical about the stuff I perceive going on in someone else's life than my own struggles. And that's exactly what this guy is doing. Tell my brother he's not being fair. And this man, he's consumed with the sin he perceives is going on in the life of his brother. And so I think we should take this as a caution. We have to be careful here. Some of us perhaps are frustrated with someone in our life, a friend, a family member, you think that they're in sin, and, and maybe they are. And you pray, God, fix that person. But can I propose to you that, that maybe why the Holy Spirit brought you here to church today is because he wants to fix you. Could it be you or the one that the Holy Spirit wants to focus on today? I want you to recall what Jesus already taught 
in Luke chapter 6, verse 41 and 42, he said, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, let's watch what happens here. How is Jesus going to respond to this interruption? But Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Are you surprised by that? Jesus is kind of talking back to this guy. He's saying, you know, you commanded me to be a referee in this. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm sorry. Since when is that my job description? When was that my mission? Getting involved in your your family squabble. Let me tell you something. I did not leave the splendors of heaven, take on flesh, live a sinless life for 30 years, and I'm now making a wide way south to a cross to tell you who gets your dad's dining room set. All right, you guys figure that out. (laughs) And I think this is great. Jesus is quite clear on what his marching orders are. And he's not a people pleaser. And he's not afraid of saying no. Notice how unapologetically he says, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because Jesus is more concerned about this guy's soul than his retirement plan. He's not an arbiter of petty earthly disputes. He's he's a savior of the world. And he's our example. In theology, we call this Christus exemplar. That as we study the life of Jesus, we see him as an example. He, He shows us how to operate. He shows us the right way to live. And I think this is one of the lessons that Jesus is teaching us here, that there are some things that I'm not called to do. Some things I'm not called to do. Just because there's a need doesn't mean that it has your name on it. This can be hard for some of us. Difficult to grasp for those of us who are fixers in here. Any of you guys a fixer? Maybe you like to fix broken pipes, Maybe you fix toys. Maybe you fix people. And this can actually become a problem. For example, you see some parents struggling with their kids. And so you put on your your little Superman cape and hop right in there and give your unsolicited advice. And it gets worse. Or or maybe you see someone in sin and you want to be be the answer for them. Or, Or maybe you see someone who needs discipling and without praying about it, you, you hop into another commitment. You agree to meet with them even though you really don't have the time. Maybe you hear about a couple who's struggling in their relationship and even though you weren't invited in, you put on your marriage fixer cape and jump into the fray and you say yes to this, that, and everything and before you know it, you're spending all your time away from your family and now you have marriage problems, right? You see how that works? You didn't realize that not every need under heaven has your name on it. And so I think we could look to Jesus as as an example here. He knew what his marching orders were. He knew what his purpose in this world was. And I think each of us needs to come to grips with that. What are our marching orders from God? And we should stay in that lane. Just because someone else wants you to do something doesn't mean that God does. And it's the fear of man which ultimately makes us say yes to too many things. And so... You know, if you're feeling spread too thin, maybe it's because you're committing to a billion things that God has never called you to in the first place. you got to ask yourself, am I doing what God has called me to do? And sometimes the answer to other people will be no. And Jesus' answer here is no to this guy. So why did Jesus come then? And one reason is to teach us the truth. I want you to see how he springboards into this next teaching now. He's continuing to respond, but now he's talking to the wider audience that's listening to all this. Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And so the the man who interrupted is, is now confronted with truth. And here's our next lesson. My value as a person is not determined by how much stuff I have. So obviously this individual was very concerned with how much stuff he had. And Jesus uses this as a a way to talk about 
material possessions and how we should view them. Now, isn't it true that when we believe something is valuable, we give it a ton of our attention? But the most valuable things in this life, according to God, are not things. The most valuable thing in this life is a relationship with God, the one who made us. He said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that's the exact opposite of what our world tells us. It's unfortunate that our world programs us to believe the exact opposite of this mentality of, of kingdom first. We're constantly inundated with other messages that our, our value is determined by things like how much money we have or how many nice things we own. And the problem is, if I as a sinner look at you with more possessions and succumb to envy and greed and covetousness, I eventually become just like this jealous brother of Luke chapter 12, thinking that's not fair, God. Why do they get to have that? I work hard. I deserve that. Change things. And so ultimately, we, we can see this brother as an example of coveting. So let's talk about coveting for a little bit. The sin of coveting is actually so offensive to God that he put it in the Big Ten. It's actually the final commandment of the Ten Commandments. It's like the exclamation point on it. Uh, we find it in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, in which God commands his people, Israel. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox. Maybe we should update that, right? Or his car or his donkey, his Tesla, I don't know. His, his motorcycle, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And it's amazing that as God revealed his law on Mount Sinai, he gave all these commandments. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't lie. Oh, and yeah, one more thing. Don't look at what other people have and think, why don't I have that? That was important to God. You think, well, well what is coveting? Just open up a social media account and you'll feel it instantly. Do you have a Facebook? Do you have an Instagram? You know what coveting is. You see these pictures of people, a nice little married couple, standing in front of the castle at Disney World, all dressed in matching outfits, little ears on their head, ice cream cone in their hands, big smiles on their faces, and you want to smack them because you're at work. You know, Lord, let that castle fall. Huh? Why can't I go there? Why can't I experience that? I'm here at work and the internet keeps cutting out and my boss is breathing down my neck and, and we covet. And why is this such a big deal to the Lord? Because coveting is the opposite of contentment. Contentment is what we should have and that's what we do have when we trust that God is a sovereign king who allows us to have exactly what we do have for a reason. And he withholds what he does from us for a reason. So we can hold these, things, these two things in opposition, coveting and contentment. Coveting is saying, God, I don't trust you. You're not good at being God because of what you've withheld from me. Give me my share. On the other hand, contentment is saying, I trust your heart, God. Thank you for everything you have and have not given me. And so Jesus is telling us to stop believing the satanic lie that, that true value is found in, in what we have. Too many people actually get into debt so they can feel like they have more value. Better clothes, more expensive vacations, better cars and boats and RVs and jet skis, and it's never ending, right? But that's not true value. That's, that's artificial value. And it doesn't determine our value as a person. And so now the Lord, because he's an awesome teacher and communicator, he's going to tell a parable to help us understand this truth even better. He's going to show us where true value is found in life. Verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. Now, the first thing I want you to notice the man in the parable is already rich. Right? That's the way it describes him at the onset. The land of a rich man was very productive. And maybe you, you read that and already you're kind of disconnecting yourself. 
And this is our temptation to dismiss the story right away, okay? This is talking about somebody who's in a different category than myself. And I'd like to say to you, hold it, consider. Right? Just because you're not a millionaire doesn't mean that the story isn't true for you and meant to illustrate something for you. And actually, this is our next point, that every single person in this room is rich. How do you feel about that? (laughs) Maybe you don't believe me. Uh, Here's some statistics. This is from a 2018 report from the Credit Suisse Research Institute. Uh, It's called the Global Wealth Report. And I'll just just read you from this report. It says, to be among the global top 10%, you may not need as much money as you think. According to the Credit Suisse Research Institute, you don't even need six figures. A net worth of 93,170 US dollars is enough to make you richer than 90% of people around the world. The Institute defines net worth or wealth as the value of financial assets plus real assets, principally housing, owned by households minus their debts. So I hope you can understand what, what's being said there. It's not just the dollar amount in your bank account. It's the worth of everything that you own. If you own your house, include that. If you own a car, include the, the value of that. It goes on to say more than 100 Two million people in America are in the 10% worldwide, far more than from any other country. You need significantly less to be among the global 50%. If you have just $4,210 to your name, you're still richer than half of the world's residents. And it takes a net worth of $871,320 to join the global 1%. More than 19 million Americans qualify. These numbers reflect the extreme level of persistent wealth inequality. While the bottom half of adults collectively owns less than 1% of total wealth, the richest decile, that is the top 10% of adults, owns 85% of global wealth, and the top percentile alone accounts for almost half of all household wealth, 47%. Now, don't worry, I'm not trying to get all woke on you or anything, all right? I just want you to realize that you as a modern-day American living in Southern California, are rich. There's no way around it. According to the Bible's definition of wealth, you and I are it. And we can't opt out here. Uh, I would venture to say, you know, if this man in the parable were, were a real person, he would look at us today, living in 21st century California, and been blown away by the amount of stuff that we have. So now back to the parable. According to Jesus here in verse 16... What produced plentifully? Did you see it? What does it say? The land. Question. Who made the land? What's that? Jesus. Yeah. God made it. And who is it that causes stuff to grow out of the land? The Lord. Yes. God. Psalm 104, 14 says this. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth. In other words, this incredible wealth is coming directly from the hand of a generous God. And this leads us to a final lesson. Every single thing I have today is a gift from God. Every single thing. Do you believe that? Does your life say that? James 1, 17 says this, Every good thing given... And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Now, we're we're not told what this man in this parable says he believes. All we're told is how he lives and operates. And when it comes to his resources, he functions like an atheist, as we'll see. That is to say, he refuses to believe that God is the one who's supplying him with all of his resources. How did the man get his crops? Well, I'm sure he worked hard. He planted seeds, parentheses, that he didn't make, in the ground that he didn't make, using hands, feet, eyes, and a brain that he didn't make. And then he had a little luck with the weather. I'm sure it rained, and he had nothing to do with that. 
And so, yes, God does praise a hard work ethic. The Bible's full of evidence that this matters to God. He rewards diligence. For example, Proverbs 12, verse 11 says this, He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. But we must always acknowledge that God is the one who provides. We work, and our work works because God made it work. He gave us the hands and feet and mind and health to work, and he's sovereign over all things, including the economy, in order that we may continue to live. And some people live like that's true, and others don't, like this rich fool. Look at what he does, verse 17. So he's seen all this success, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? This is uh, one of those first world problems, right? Oh no, I have so much stuff, I have nowhere to put it. Verse 18, then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He got to love that. He's, he's talking to himself. He's like, self? <laughs> And his motto is the chief motto of the worldly value system. We've heard this before, eat, drink, and be merry. That actually comes uh, from Isaiah chapter 22. The prophet Isaiah spoke of this mindset in a time when Jerusalem was, was unrepentant for their sin. I'll just read it to you, Isaiah 22, 12, and 13. It says, Therefore, in that day, the Lord God of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head, and to wearing sackcloth. Instead... There is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. And that was a time when Jerusalem should have been taking their sin extremely seriously because judgment was coming in the form of a foreign nation to wipe them out. But they, they said, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, we Americans, we fully embrace this motto as well. We, we live like this is all there is. This is all we got. Why right, we even have a little uh, phrase for that? YOLO. You heard that? That was big like 15 years ago probably. I still hear it every once in a while. It stands for you only live once. That's not biblical. <laughs> it's not. Here's another interesting thing about what we're reading here. Clearly this, not, this man is not being held up as a good example, right? Because he's going to be called a fool. Uh, but it's interesting that this is the one and only place in the Bible that talks about retirement so to speak and it's a negative thing and maybe you're uh, inside of you you're getting all bent out of shape now you know I, I was looking forward to moving to florida and playing shuffleboard in my golden years you know collecting sea stars and seashells and i just want to stop you right there this is not about working a career till you die but rather a question you know are you stewarding your life well for God, he's entrusted you with stuff, with many resources. And are you, are you still serving him? Or are you just thinking about yourself? What are you doing with what you've been given? As Jesus will say later in this chapter, in verse 48, he says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And we don't ever retire from Jesus, right? So now let's take this all the way home. Look at verse 20. So God hears what this man is saying to himself. He hears everything. God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the only parable where God speaks directly to an individual. And the word he uses to describe this man is fool. Why does he call him that? As we've discussed this man is living his life with no regard for God. He's living like God isn't real. And the biblical definition of fool is, is someone like that. Psalm 14 verse 1 says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Ergo, to have no fear of God is to be a fool. The opposite of that is wisdom. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But this guy is not thinking about God at all. He's just thinking about himself. And, and actually, if you look at the, just, just look at this parable, and I want you to notice all of the first person personal pronouns in here. 
I, me, my, mine. You look at it, it's actually one third of the words used in this parable are those. And so we, we come away with the picture that this guy is just totally absorbed with himself. The Holy Trinity for him is me, myself, and I. And rather than worshiping God with his wealth, he's worshiping his wealth. Or you could put it this way, his possessions possess him. Just notice the language. He's, he's convinced that, that he's the owner of everything. My crops, my barn, my grain, even his soul he calls my soul. But his fatal flaw is found in verse 17. The first person he consults about his future is himself. When he ought to be looking up and saying, Lord, what do you want? You've given me more than enough. You are so generous, and I want to be like you, Father. I want to be generous too. So what do you want, Lord? And that's something that we should ask. God, what do you want me to do with what you blessed me with? Are there some single mothers who are struggling that I could bless? Is there a missionary I can bless? Can I invest in the local church? Not only for myself and my family, but for other families and for the future, for the next generation. And that's an attitude that we call stewardship. Understanding that God is the owner and we're the stewards. We manage and take care of what ultimately is his. The rich fool fails to understand this, that he is only a steward of everything that's been entrusted to him for a season of time and eventually his loan will become due. Now at this point, I just want to make sure that this is crystal clear. It is not a sin to be rich. It is not a sin to have resources. And it's also not just rich people who can be greedy. Poor people can be greedy too. As we look through the Bible, we find plenty of people who were blessed financially who were generous and held up as great examples. In Luke chapter 8, we have Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, that actually funded Jesus and the disciples' ministry. It says, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. And then in John 19, there's Joseph of Arimathea, who's a rich, respected council member. He actually donated his tomb to Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, there's Lydia, a wealthy seller of purple fabrics. She gets saved, and she opens up her home to the apostles, dedicates her life to supporting the ministry. So what does the Bible say to those who are rich, like we are today? I want you to flip your Bible, if you would, First Timothy 6. We're going to end it here. We'll look at verses 17 through 19. God doesn't command the rich not to be rich, but rather to see everything that has been entrusted to them as a gift belonging ultimately to God. Uh, to see themselves as stewards. Now I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul's instructions here. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 it says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Uh, that, that word in Greek there is, is zoe, that is true life, the kind of life that really matters. And so let's conclude. When you understand that everything is God's, it becomes easy to become a cheerful giver. Uh, anybody have 20 bucks in here? 20 bucks? Tracy? Nice, nice crisp 20 here. Hmm. Oh, just, just printed, freshly printed. All right. I'm feeling kind of generous, uh, so don't be shy. Anybody want this $20 bill? Man, that felt good. That felt good. Now, my family, why was that so easy for me to do? <laughs> Think about that. Because it wasn't mine to begin with, was it? 
That's actually the key to understanding what it means to be a cheerful giver. And uh, Jeremy, don't be a thief, all right? God sees you. Give that back to Tracy afterwards, all right? Oh, right now. All right. He's keeping short accounts. I like it. <laughs> all right. So there you go, folks. There's your, uh, there's your money sermon. Our God loves to give good gifts. His desire is that we would look like him when we give, that we would give to others out of gratitude, not duty, with thanksgiving in our hearts, not begrudgingly. And let's remember the gospel, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave. He gave us his best in Christ. And Jesus came to give us a far greater inheritance than any earthly inheritance. He came to give us a heavenly inheritance. He came to give us eternal life. And he died on the cross for your sin, for my sin, including the sins of greed and coveting. And so today, would you repent and would you trust in him for your soul's salvation? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who tells us the hard words so that we would have soft hearts. Father, we pray that we would reflect you in the generosity, that we would be cheerful givers because you gave the gift of your son to us who were undeserving. And we thank you that Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross for us. No one took his life from him. He laid it down of his own accord out of love for us. And then he took it back up again. On the third day, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death and offering eternal life to all who would trust in him as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that that would be someone here today. If you are moving in their heart, I pray that they would respond to the work of your spirit, that convicting work to realize that they are not the God of the universe, that there is a God of the universe. Maybe they've been living like this rich fool, just living for the here and now and not thinking about eternal things, where they came from, why they're here and where they're going. But God, you want to reach out to them. You want a relationship with them. That's the most important thing. And so they can start that today by receiving the free gift of salvation, crying out to you saying, God, forgive me of my sins. I turn and I trust in Jesus, your son, whom you sent to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he did that for me. And I believe that he conquered sin and death when he rose on the third day. And just as he lives, I will live too. So Father, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.